Have any homework questions? Yes. Okay, energy number 16. Uh, Um, okay, so energy number 16. Um, so um, you have a pendulum that's released from rest. Hey, hey, please. Okay, so um, it's released from rest. Uh, this angle in general is theta. And um, when time is equal to zero, uh, theta is equal to Capital theta, there's a capital theta with a squish on each side. Um, the string length is uh, L. So we just have a general constant value for the length. Um, and we want to uh, figure out the object's speed um, as a function of the current angle theta. Okay. So um, what's the speed of the mass as a function of theta? Okay, so if it starts at this at this constant capital theta out here or something, and then as time goes by, that theta changes as it rotates back and forth. And we want to figure out at whatever the value of theta is, wherever it is in this path, um, we want to figure out uh, what the speed is. So the first thing we need to do is. Um, this is in the section on energy methods. Um, so you know you're going to use an energy approach to this. Even if it wasn't, like, because, you know, in the future on tests, you're going to have to figure out whether it's appropriate to use energy methods or not. Um, so um, remember that uh, the work energy principle and conservation of mechanical energy um, are useful when you want to uh, have a relationship, get a relationship. So these give relationships. between uh, position variables and speed. Okay, that's almost always what you're going to be using uh, the energy approach for. So when you look at this problem, you can see it's relating speed to theta and theta you can use to tell you what the position of that thing is. And so that should be like sort of your hint. If you see this in just some random section, some random test or whatever, um, it's relating speed to something having to do with position. So you're going to look, think about a possible energy approach. Okay. Um, okay. So let's draw a free body diagram of the thing at a at an arbitrary instant in the motion. 
there's a weight force down. And there's a cable force T. So if we're trying to figure out whether we're going to use the work energy principle or conservation of mechanical energy, what we're trying to figure out is, are all of, is all of the work done by force fields or is there any work done by non-conservative forces? Okay, so um, the cable tension is non-conservative, but it doesn't do any work because it's centripetal. Uh, anything swinging on a cable is moving in a circular path and the cable is pointing toward the center of the circle. So um, this cable force T does no work. And then the weight, we're used to treating that as a potential energy. Um, that's a conservative force or a force field. And so these together tell us we can use conservation of mechanical energy. All right, so the idea in conservation of mechanical energy is um, we're going to think of some instant one and some instant two. And we know that if we add up the potential energy, all the potential energies uh, with the kinetic energy, that sum of those things has to be equal at the two instants. That has to stay constant. Um, okay, so when it's released, well, let's think about, um, okay, so here's the object, and we're starting out at a height or an angle capital theta, um, and we need to use that, that value theta here and then the, the general variable theta to represent a height of this thing because um, the potential energy due to gravity is MGH. That's the potential energy function. Okay, so what is the height of this thing as a function of theta? Um, you could write it a couple of ways. Um, you could think of it as um, so if you think of so the, the length of the string is L, but the height is determined by, you know, if you break this up into, you know, write this as a right triangle. This leg of the right triangle is what tells us the height. Okay. And so if we choose, um, I think the easiest way to do it is if we choose our H equals zero to be here, Um, then the height is always going to be negative if it's down in, you know, down below horizontal. Um, and it's going to be negative L times the cosine of that theta. Okay. So this distance here is L cosine theta. But if h is equal to zero, then the height has to be negative. So we can write this as um, the gravitational potential energy is equal to mg times negative L cosine theta. So here's the negative. Okay, negative M G L cosine of capital theta. That's the potential energy when it's released. And what's the kinetic energy at the instant it's released? 
yeah, it's released from rest. So, you know, one half mass times zero squared is zero. And then our second instant is going to be at some arbitrary angle, lowercase theta. So the potential energy at this instant, what's this going to be if the angle is lowercase theta instead of capital theta? Negative. I mean, we're just going to replace the capital theta with the lowercase. Uh, so negative MGL cosine lowercase theta. You see that? I mean, what we have something like. Uh, so now our angle here is lowercase theta. Our H equals zero is still here. And so this length is L times the cosine of lowercase theta. And the kinetic energy this time, we don't know what the speed is. So we're just going to have to write this as one half times the mass times the speed squared. And so conservation of mechanical energy says negative MGL cosine capital theta plus zero is equal to negative MGL cosine of lowercase theta plus one half mv squared. Um, divide both sides by m and you can get rid of all of these. Uh, and then um, group these together and you get G L times the quantity cosine little theta minus cosine capital theta is equal to one half V squared and so V is equal to plus or minus uh, 2GL times the quantity cosine little theta minus cosine capital theta um, all square root. And this is a speed, so we want the positive. Okay, so where is this going to be going the fastest? Um, yeah, that's exactly right. So um, what this says, if so whether uh, theta is positive like this or negative like that, um, cosine is an even function. So cosine of negative 5 degrees or whatever is the same as cosine of 5 degrees. So the biggest difference you can get between cosine theta and cosine capital theta is, you know, capital theta is just where it starts. And the biggest difference is when it swings through the bottom. And then it starts, cosine of theta starts getting closer to the original value. So the fastest it ever goes is right at the bottom. And at the bottom, uh, this is equal to uh, when... I must have a, do I have a negative moment here? Um, zero, negative. Uh, 
Um, well, so if you add up all this stuff and said it equals all this stuff, um, I think the signs in my calculation are right. Uh, cosine, oh no, okay, yeah. So, sorry, uh, cosine of zero is one. I was thinking it was zero. So, um, when it's at the bottom, the fastest it ever goes is the square root of 2GL times the quantity 1 minus cosine of capital theta. Any questions about that one? Any other homework questions you want to see? Uh, number three, rigid body. Okay, rigid body kinematics. Um, so an object's connected to a string and it swings around in a horizontal circle. So its path looks something like this. And at every location, the angle between the string and the vertical is theta. Um, the length of the string is L. And the speed of the mass Um, so the speed of the mass is the square root of G L uh, tangent of theta times sine of theta. Um, and we just want to calculate the acceleration vector of that mass. Take a view from above. There's the mass. Our coordinate system. I'm going to use XY like this. And notice that even though the string isn't in the XY plane, the motion of the mass is in the XY plane. You see that? I mean, the mass is just swinging around in this circle, even though the cable is angled up a little bit. And so now we're just doing a circular motion problem. Um, so what do we know about the directions? Uh, does it say, it doesn't say clockwise or, oh yeah, it does. It's going this way. So it's going clockwise. Uh, that means that the velocity vector is down. Um, it's uh, moving with a constant speed, and that means that don't draw that. That means that it isn't here. Uh, it's not changing speed. And so the only part of the acceleration is the centripetal toward the center. So there's the centripetal acceleration, and that's also the total acceleration. Um, so the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration 
is omega times r yeah thank you um You can also think of this as, uh, you know, since the velocity magnitude is equal to omega times r, you can combine these two and um, the centripetal acceleration can also be expressed as v squared over r, okay, because v squared is omega squared r squared, and so it's just v squared and then divided up by those r's. If you don't, if you didn't see that or whatever, this saves you one, one step or something. Uh, you can just figure out based on the speed that it's going, figure out the distance that it travels, uh, calculate the, well, let's see. So, to express this as an angular velocity, um, the speed is given as square root of GL uh, tangent of theta sine of theta. Um, and that's equal to the distance divided by the time. Um, is that how I want to do that? Uh, that is equal to, well, let's just think of that as um, omega times the radius. And so omega is equal to square root of GL tan theta, sine theta. Divided by L. And then you could plug it into the original formula. Either one of those ways works fine. Okay, well, all of this gives us that the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration Yes, thank you. So what we need here for the radius of the circle is, we need this, and this is equal to L sine theta. Uh, that's, that's the opposite of this, so that's L sine theta. Okay, so omega is um, so this should not be L, this should be R, so this should be um, omega times L uh, sine theta. And so then omega is um, this divided by L sine theta. And if you plug it into either one of these, um, so use omega squared r or v squared over r to get the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. That's this square root squared. So now it's just gl times the tangent of theta times the sine of theta. Um, 
v squared over r, which is L sine theta. The L's cancel, the sine theta's cancel, and you get a magnitude of centripetal acceleration of G tan theta. Now, from thinking about this as a circular motion, um, we know that that centripetal acceleration is in the negative x direction. So the centripetal acceleration vector is negative g times tangent of theta, zero for y. And since it's moving with a constant speed, this is also the total acceleration. Any questions about that? Any other homework questions? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's just say, let me think about that. I mean, um, so it just says that it has an angular velocity omega and an angular acceleration alpha. So we'll just assume that if those are positive, they're counterclockwise. Um, and so uh, we can set it up uh, assuming that those are counterclockwise. And then if the, uh, you know, if the numbers came out negative, then it, everything would be switched. But the numbers would all, like the calculation that we're going to do will work whether it's positive or negative. Um, okay, so this one, you have a mass over here. Um, it has an angular velocity omega. Um, since we're, if omega is positive, um, then that's a counterclockwise rotation. So that means that that corresponds to a velocity direction like that. Um, same thing with alpha. We're going to assume that that's counterclockwise. And so the tangential acceleration is this way. And then the centripetal is toward the center. Um, the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration is omega squared r. Um, and that's actually what we're using. Uh, so omega is our is our constant representing the angular velocity. Alpha is our constant representing the angular acceleration. Um, we're assuming that we have a radius of r. And so this is as detailed as we can get about the centripetal acceleration. Um, so the centripetal acceleration vector is in the positive x direction. So we know the value of omega squared r for x, zero for y. And then the magnitude of the tangential acceleration Um, so 
So the tangential acceleration was pointing down. Uh, the magnitude of the tangential acceleration is alpha r. And so since it's pointing in the negative y direction, the tangential acceleration vector is 0, negative alpha r. And so the total acceleration vector is the tangential plus the centripetal that's omega squared r for the x component, negative alpha r for the y component. It asks for the velocity vector to um, the velocity magnitude, the speed is just equal to omega times r. Uh, that was pointing down, so the velocity vector is zero negative omega r. Any questions about that one? Any other homework questions? Yes. Energy? Okay, so energy number 18. It says that um, the potential energy function, well, there are two, it's divided up into two separate potential energy functions. The first one, U1, is 5x, and the second one, U2, is 2y squared. And so the total potential energy is just the sum of these, 5x plus 2y squared. Um, and it asks for the, um, the force uh, as a function of the position for that potential energy one, then for potential energy two, and then for the sum of those two. Um, the force due to the potential energy U1 is negative partial of U1 with respect to x for the x component, negative partial of u1 uh, with respect to y, for the y component. Um, so for partial of u1 with respect to x, um, the function is 5x. Anything that's not an x, treat it like a constant and take the derivative with respect to x. So this term, uh, this component comes out to be negative 5. And then uh, for the partial with respect to y, um, we'll assume that anything that's not a y is constant. Take the derivative with respect to y. So that means that this 5x we're treating like it's a constant. And if you take the derivative with respect to the derivative of a constant with respect to y, you get zero. And then for part B, we want a representation of the force vector, uh, the force uh, field that's represented by potential energy U2. So that force field is negative partial of U2 with respect to X, negative partial of U2 with respect to Y. Um, for the X component, we're gonna assume, so the function we're looking at now is two Y squared. So assume anything that's not an X is a constant. That means that 2y squared we're treating as a constant. And when you take a derivative of a constant with respect to x, you get 0. 
And then for the y component, um, we'll assume that x is constant, take derivative with respect to y, and take the negative of that, so you get negative 4y. And that tells you the force applied by that second force field for any given position. In this case, it only varies as you go up and down. And then the last one is what's the total force vector applied at a given location? The total force is the force applied by field one plus the force applied by field two, and you get negative five, negative four y. Um, you can calculate the force fields, the force vectors for the individual force fields and then add those force vectors together. Or you can add the two potential energy functions together at the start and calculate, just go right to calculating the total force. It comes out the same either way. It's just because uh, derivatives are a linear multiple, a linear operator. Um, so uh, adding the derivatives is the same as adding the functions and then taking the derivatives. Any other homework questions? Yep. Uh, yeah, I want the whole binder. It's a little, uh, I know it's a little inconvenient, but um, I do want to look at the notes and stuff. If you don't have it ready today, bring it, you know, for the, and I think only half the class is supposed to turn it in today, right? Just the, the ones with the first lab. If you don't have it today, don't worry about it. Bring it tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever. Yes. I don't tend to look for those, but I, I think it's a good idea to have them in there for future reference. So, but if you didn't put them in, I wouldn't mark you down for it. Yes. B. Okay, so if the object is at rest at the origin, what's its speed at the position three, negative one? Okay, uh, I think this one comes out to be like imaginary. Um, so let's pretend I didn't ask this question. Let's say um, if at the origin, the object had a speed of 15 meters per second, Uh, what's the object's speed at the position 3, negative 1? Um, well, this is asking for a relationship between a position and a speed. So you're probably going to want to use either work energy principle or conservation of mechanical energy. This one, it says uh, that there are, um, it says there's no work done by any non-conservative forces. So we can use conservation of mechanical energy. Um, so instant one, we're going to say it's at the origin. Instant two, is at the location three, negative one. The total potential energy at the origin um, the total potential energy function is 5x plus 2y squared um,
So at the origin, we have five times zero. Uh, plus two times zero squared. So the potential energy is zero. The kinetic energy is one half times the mass. So one half times the mass times the speed that we said is 15 meters per second squared. At instant two, the potential energy is five times three plus two times negative one squared. And so that's 17. The kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the speed squared. So conservation of mechanical energy says zero plus one half M times 225 is equal to 17 plus one half MV squared. Um, so 112.5 M minus 17 is equal to one half mv squared. So v is equal to uh, 225 um, minus 34 over m square root. And we want the positive. I think what happens, I think I remember someone saying that if you, uh, if you assume that the speed is zero at the origin, then um, when you have the higher potential energy here, that means you have to have a lower kinetic energy than zero makes sense. I mean, it makes sense that that doesn't work. That doesn't make any sense. You end up with an imaginary speed and I've never heard of that being a real thing. So let's pretend that's what the question said. 